Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to the McNay Art Museum. I'm Rich Asty. I'm the director of this remarkable institution. I'm only the third director the muse museum's had in 64 years. And tonight, uh, because we're at the height of Hispanic Heritage Month, I also am very proud to announce that I am the first Hispanic director of this museum. Thank you. <laughs> Así, si alguien habla español, le quería dar la gran bienvenida al Museo de Arte McNay. Me llamo Ricardo Aste, el primer director hispano de esta gran institución. Si no lo sabían antes de esta noche, entraron hoy al primer museo de arte moderno en todo el estado de Texas. So, that's great. I'm glad. So I, I won't have to translate that for anyone else. Is what you're saying. So for the only thing I added there is that if you didn't know it tonight, when you came onto our campus, our 23 acres, you also entered the first modern art museum in the whole state of Texas. And we can take no credit for that. That is all thanks to our visionary founder, Marion Kugler McNay. We're named after her, a woman who was well ahead of her time, not from here like me, fell in love with a place she did not grow up in. But when you spend more time in San Antonio, you'll understand why. She came here during her first marriage on her way to Laredo and came back for her third and stayed, <laughs> stayed for her fourth and fifth. <laughs> And uh, before passing away in 1950 with no children, she had a great, great vision for what her property could become. And when I speak of her property, you're on what was once 114 acres and a Spanish colonial mansion, which is open to you tonight with a world-class collection of modern and contemporary art only because she was interested in the art of her time. And also 700, uh, in addition to the paintings, some decorative arts, but some of the groundbreaking works that she was buying in the 20s and 30s included Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Picasso when no one else in this part of the world was focusing on those, on those moments. In fact, if you follow Architectural Digest, the June issue just a few months ago had a beautiful article titled, Three Travel-Worthy Museums Created by a Woman. And we were in great company. They were all modern with the Kroller Utterlo Museum, uh, Kroller Muller uh, Museum outside of Amsterdam and a museum in South France. So uh, we have a tremendous legacy here and since opening after her passing, we opened in 1954 with that great distinction of the first modern art museum in the whole state of Texas. We've been championing those who have been underrepresented, uh, including women artists in particular because that's how we got here and also artists of color. And the show that we just opened last night, which is open to you after this lecture, uh, is a testament to our commitment to being as inclusive as every museum should be in this country. And it's Pop America. I didn't mispronounce America. Pop America, 1965 to 75. It's on view directly above you. It's our major fall show and our first collaboration with Duke University's National Museum of Art. And it's the first ever anywhere Pan American view of the pop art movement. So we know it familiar, we're familiar with it because of Andy Warhol and Robert Indiana, Klaus Oldenburg, they're in the show, but they're paired with their counterparts south of the border. And you're in for a major, major surprise of what was going on in these countries. But enough about us, let me talk about you. We are very honored to be hosting tonight not only the 44th Byzantine Studies Conference, but also the keynote lecture. And since 1954, the McNay has been committed to artistic excellence and excellence in everything we do. So we thought the right person to uh, embody our commitment to excellence is your speaker, Helen C. Evans, curator of Byzantine Art at the Met. Uh, and my colleague will be introducing her shortly, but I do wanna give a shout out to her recent publication accompanying the exhibition at the Met and um, copies are available uh, just outside of the lecture hall, but also both of these are available at our store directly above you. And a little bit more of, of what you're in store for after this lecture. Um, once we're through, you will have complete access to the entire museum, the Papa Medica exhibition, but also our collection. And the collection spans typically just 180 to 200 years. And you may be wondering why we're hosting the Byzantine Studies Conference here at the first modern art museum in Texas. And the reason why is because a year after opening in 1954, just one year later, we received a very small but special gift of medieval and Renaissance art. A friend of our founder, Mrs. McNay, Dr. Frederick Oppenheimer and his wife, within a year of our opening, 
were frustrated that they also had a vision of opening an art museum in San Antonio and we beat them to it. So instead they joined forces and gifted to us their great private collection of medieval and Renaissance European painting and sculpture. And my dear friend and Professor Annie Labatt, who needs absolutely no introduction in this room, was kind enough earlier this year to give three masterclass lectures on the Byzantine collection to our visitors and our audience and our community right here in this room, and it was standing room only. So there is a reason for you being here, even though we are a modern art museum, and I encourage you to take in that collection and the, the context that we've presented it in here in San Antonio after the lecture. It's on the upper floor of our original mansion from 1929. So um, speaking of Annie Labatt, we've had the great pleasure of working together when she was a San Antonian. Her native city is here. And she's since decamped. And uh, she can maybe share a little bit about that. But I'm delighted to see her back here. And I'm also delighted that she uh, collaborated with you and with us to have this important keynote lecture right here at the McNay. So please join me in, in welcoming the person who made all of this happen for us tonight, Annie Labatt. Thank you, Rich. You may not have known when choosing to come to this lecture that you would be surrounded by Byzantinists. You may not have thought that there were very many such people to begin with. But it just so happens that there are going to be about 100 Byzantinists in town this weekend, giving and listening to lectures about art, history, theology, philology, literature. It is not a stretch to say that each and every one of those scholars has been moved and inspired by the scholarship of Helen Evans. Her scholarship takes many forms, publications, teaching, lecturing, but it is through her grand exhibitions at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that she has been, that she has most given Byzantium its due. Her first large show was Glory of Byzantium in 1997, when she told the very intimidating Frenchman Philippe de Montebello, the president of the Met at the time, that she could do a show about Byzantine art to top the one he had seen in Paris, and she did. She really put Byzantium on the map. In 2004, she did Byzantium Faith and Power, focusing on the splendors of late Byzantine objects. In 2011, she did a show about the shifting artistic affiliations between Islamic and Byzantine reigns, uh, regions in Byzantium and Islam, and now Armenia, a show that the Wall Street Journal tells us is suffused with the spirit of this first Christian nation, the home to Noah's Ark, the center of many trading routes throughout the Mediterranean, and the site of many 20th century exiles and traumas. So, you may not have known you would be surrounded by Byzantinists, but I can promise that just as Dr. Evans has touched each of these scholars, you too will be touched. You may even become a Byzantinist. I did. In 2003, I was a recent graduate of Barnard when I learned about the beautiful catalog of Glory of Byzantium. As an undergraduate, I really had had no introduction to Byzantine anything. It was amazing to learn about it through the beautiful catalog. Weeks later, I happened to have a meeting with a curator at the Met, Marion Ainsworth, who had been one of my professors at Barnard, and it just so happened that she knew that the very woman who had crafted and curated that exhibition needed a research assistant on her new big show, and my path was forged. As you will see, once you are in her sphere, you cannot help but be passionate about this field because she has shaped it and, shaped and shared it in such incredible and unforgettable ways, and in ways she might not even realize. In every survey that I teach, I play the video that she did for the Met about the David Plates. Every time, her voice brings me such joy. In it, I hear her infinite encouragement, erudition, and generosity, all of which my students enjoy. And now, you can hear that special voice too. Thank you for welcoming my mentor to San Antonio, and thank you, Helen, for sharing that extraordinary thing, for sharing the extraordinary things that you do with my hometown. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you. That was incredibly lovely. I don't think I can keep up with it. Um, <laughs> um, I um, am the Mary Michael Shaharis Curator for Byzantine Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in the time that I have been at the Met, as Annie says, I have done a variety of exhibitions and installations to try to make people more aware of what all of, or not all of you, some of you, many of you study this uh, world that is in the east of Mediterranean. And we are now doing a show on Armenia, but I wanted to set the context a little because Armenia is at the edge of the west, uh, the beginning of the east as we'll see, and it comes out of a tradition of what we've been trying to do. So in 2000, we were able to install galleries specifically uh, dedicated to Byzantine art in the Met, right inside the main entrance by the Great Stair, and to make use of, well, that's great, um, beautiful objects that we had owned since 1917 as works of Byzantium, more than being origins of Western European art, which was much of the way that they were installed. These are the Jamati enamels from high Byzantine culture. And we, in that large space, were still able to tuck away a small area on Armenia. Uh, so you see the case with Armenian manuscripts and the large stone cross, um, the Hachkar, on loan to us from the Republic of Armenia. My commitment to Armenia is in part that it's my dissertation topic. Uh, so I have a great interest in it, and we will there. What I want to make clear is that we see Armenia as a part of the larger Byzantine sphere, not part of Byzantium itself. The Empire of the Romans ruled from New Rome, Constantinople, and Orthodox in its religions. Armenia is, in fact, a Christian religion, but not Orthodox. And so even when we did the Gloria Byzantium, and you're seeing the large entrance area where you marched past rows of crosses, and any of you who are worried about what, whether anybody knows whether you know what a Byzantium is or not, you can never do worse than the man halfway through the show who turned to his wife, very well-dressed gentleman, and said, who are these Byzantines that they live before or after Christ? And every object in the room had Christ on it. Oh. <laughs> he's, our, he's my all-time favorite for what you're trying to teach people about. <laughs> The, ca the catalog that Annie likes is the picture up here. And in that show, we did first the, the core, the empire, and then peripheral states, of whom one was Armenian, churches and pictures, manuscripts that we borrowed. And then we went out to Byzantium and its connection with Islam, and Byzantium and its connections with the West. So we are building on a tradition as we go forward, and in 2004, when we brought 50-some-odd objects from the Monastery of St. Catherine at Sinai and focused it on St. Catherine herself, still in those galleries, we connected to Byzantium to the larger world, and we had Armenian objects. In the first exhibition, we were arguing for the importance of this empire, which was generally thought to have lost its importance with the great church of Hagia Sophia in the sixth century. So we were talking about in the first show to 1261 and in this show between 1261 and 1557 when the empire is collapsing and yet it has this extravagant era of superb art as smaller kingdoms compete and their influence goes further abroad. Then the 2011 show I'm simply showing you because it was the weirdest thing I did a show which I was arguing um, and still firmly believe that early, Byzant early Islamic art is strongly influenced by Byzantine art because early Islamic territories are former Byzantine territories. So I got an award from the Republic of Iran. Um, they brought me to, to Tehran to win an award for the, first, the best book of the year on Islamic art, uh, which I'm very flattered by, but I, we did not talk about any of the world of Persia in the show. What we did was to take great works, these chalices are from northern Syria, and see how they could have woven into and have been relevant to the first generations of Islamic art. And now we're going to do a show, or I have just opened a week ago, a show that focuses on one culture over time, 
uh, Byzantium and Islam was a moment in time, the seventh and ninth century, and a very specific area, essentially greater Syria and Egypt, a little of North Africa, a little further out, but essentially looking at a moment and what changes. Now what we're doing is saying that you should look at these peripheral cultures of the center for what they are and how they define themselves and the degree to which they are interested in being like the center itself and where they're defining themselves in other ways. And I would think that if it's successful, that we should over the next 10, 20 years have shows how many others of these peripheral cultures, the Serbs, the Bulgarians, um, the Rus, and, and recognize, as I've always tried to do, that Byzantium's territories were huge. It lasted a thousand years, for those of you who are still wondering what we're talking about. And we, when I started studying um, Byzantine art, we, we treated it as if everything good was essentially from Constantinople and that everything else was lesser. Uh, but we didn't do that in the same way for Western Europe. So if we're going to look at Western European sites as important individually, we owe the same thing to the lands of the, Ar the Byzantines and their irritating and often uh, very compelling neighbor to their east. Um, for the exhibition, as we tried to figure out how to tell people where Armenia was, we ended up um, deciding to tell you that the Armenians are the people who originate at the foot of Mount Ararat, whose two, whose two peaks are across the top of this screen. That is not Mount Fuji, this is Mount Ararat. Um, Japanese tourists prefer another definition. Um, the, to do it geopolitically, it's south of Russia, east of Azerbaijan, west of uh, Turkey, north of Iran. It doesn't really help people in the South Caucasus. None of those terms make much more sense to anyone. So we bring you into the exhibition focusing on just the homeland, but we put on our website, so I've given you the information, an interactive map that you can go to and you will be able to track the Armenians as far as we track them in the show. So at the end of this talk, there will be Armenians in Jamestown and Manila and in their homeland and pretty much all the way in between. And they will be controlling trade routes that reach across those lands. What makes the Armenians distinctive in their own minds, there are people that have existed long before uh, they became a Christian nation, is that at the beginning of the fourth century, the very beginning of the century, um, an Armenian king ravishes a uh, beautiful young woman in the tradition of many Christian uh, conversions um, and kills her. And in his case, King Tradat becomes a wild boar. He has behaved like a wild boar and he becomes one. And so we see him here on this very early stele that opens the galleries with a pig's head. And he is, um, unable to cure himself. He knows what he does, has done. He knows that it is not good. His sister suggests that he brings Gregory the Illuminator, who is here, out of the pit that he has been in for 14 years um, and have him, this Christian monk, um, help. And Gregory the Illuminator converts King Tradat. King Tradat converts his people so that for the first time a body of people become Christian together as opposed to individual conversions. Christian missionaries have been in Armenia for centuries, but this is when a body of people um, convert. And I am sorry, we, this is a problem we had somewhere else. This is a map, which is actually solid. You're gonna have to look at it in the book, but it is Matthew Paris's 13th century map showing you that the Armenians in the 13th century that go to St. Albans Abbey in England, tell Matthew Paris, whom people that study medieval English art are quite aware of, that they live at the foot of Mount Ararat and that Noah's Ark is protected there by snakes and dragons and the little black and red lines on the map. And the map describes the Armenians as controlling all the lands to India. 
They are the pinch point, the funnel spot on northern trade routes so that in the fourth, fifth, sixth centuries when this is being done, you have jewelry in the show that reflects the fact that they are connected to Eastern art and to Western art, and they are creating a sense, are maintaining a sense of personal um, identity by in part developing an alphabet um, for their language that can be used to translate Christian text. And that is done by Mezro Mashtat, who is still a major figure in Armenian identification. And this is the Armenian alphabet that will become more um, fluid, more curvilinear over the years, but will always be one of the ways that Armenians, particularly if you're merchants on trade routes, you have what is essentially a secret language. Um, you have a language that in the installation of our exhibition, we had couriers coming from a number of Armenian sites, and I had a fellow from Helwan University in Cairo, Egypt, whom you might have thought would be no use to me, but Mary Capel, Professor Capellian is an Armenian, and she was chatting with all of the couriers the whole time. Her family on one side goes back to the Fatimids, so the 12th century Armenians in Egypt, and on the other side to more recent arrivals. And we attempt in the exhibition and in the catalog to show you how these people um, identify themselves in a way that is important, and important enough that they should be more widely understood as part of the history of Christian art. So this is the type of site that are the Armenian churches. This is the monastery of Tatev, and the figure at the lower right is Gregory of Tatev, one of the great Armenian theologians, one who is still read today. And the image itself is painted uh, by Armenians in one of their many outposts where they controlled trade routes in Crimea and modern Poland. As you go through our galleries, the goal was to give you a sense of that architecture that you saw in the monastery of Tatev and that you see elsewhere on photographs in the galleries. And we were able to bring, through the generosity of the History Museum of Armenia, a number of extremely large pieces of sculpture. So the church models that we can give you here, repeated here for you, and this is a little one, give you a sense of how Armenian architecture is like giant building blocks a cube, a square on the cube, a tall cylinder, and then a cone. And that variations of that are what Armenians use over the centuries as they build a um, sense of identity that is even in their architecture. Some of it has limited decoration on the exterior, and these are from exteriors. But many of them, as here and repeated here, just have little tiny bits of elegant molding and that I'm particularly fond of this little eyebrow because you trace it back to the fourth, fifth century churches in Syria that Armenian architecture to a degree evolves from. And the large monumental piece, and this is so large that it goes almost to the ceiling right here in the, pic in the gallery, is a hotchkar, a cross stone. Uh, what has become in modern times the symbol of the Armenians, these great memorial markers that you need to think of the fact that when they are erected, the Armenians are under Muslim rule. So it's not like putting up a Christian or Jewish symbol in an American city where no one particularly cares. This is a statement um, in the face of maybe tolerant, but still uh, definitely a different religious um, control. And the um, one that we borrowed uh, for those of you who have ever been interested in Armenian uh, hotchkars, it actually has an entire stone lug across here that I've never seen discussed in Armenian um, books, and we did not know it was coming. So it took us a week and a half to accommodate in the galleries. Uh, it's something of a problem. What I've also been thinking about in looking at these is um, after their installation, the, sto the churches are very severe, and these cross stones, which often stand around them, are so elaborately and intricately embroidered that you have to wonder if you in some way are looking at something that connects to what we know was a great tradition of textiles. Armenians control textile trade routes. We have records of sites in Armenia being famous for their 
purple carpets for this and that, none of it survives. And I wonder if we'll ever be able to connect um, these hutch cars in some way to that. The other thing that the show revealed that we had not uh, really thought about <coughs> was that many of these buildings are built at a time when the, Mon the Mongols control Armenia. And there are many, many manuscripts in which people write um, about the devastations that the Mongols do to their lands, the number of people killed, the places destroyed. And we tend to think that this is a period of almost no art and culture, but at least three Armenian families control trade routes for the Mongols, and they become quite wealthy doing it. And by the accident of what I could borrow and what survives, I have several pieces from the family of the Proch. And this is Amir Hassan, I, the son of the gentleman here, who's donating this gilded reliquary with his hands up in the prayer pose. These are works at a moment that we would think there was no wealth, there was no power in Armenia. The Armenians are running particularly textile trade from China, where the Mongols are, to the Mediterranean. And the Prost, the Arbelians, the Zakarians are clearly uh, becoming quite wealthy from it and very dominant. And they uh, promote extensively um, intellectual life. So there are a number of monastic scriptoria that are under their patronage and under their funding. And we often find in Armenia these beautiful um, reliquaries of the True Cross where right at the center you have a rock crystal and then a tiny fragment of the True Cross. We have records of Byzantine emperors giving uh, bits of the True Cross to Armenian rulers. And we also um, have the Armenian tradition that St. Ripsame herself brought the true, true cross um, to Armenia. What will happen in this period when the Mongols are in control of greater Armenia, the foot of Mount Ararat, is that a large number of Armenians are moved by the Byzantine Empire inland, uh, away from the Anatolian plain, away from the east, and the most successful of them are the ones who move all the way to the Mediterranean and control the kingdom of Cilicia, which is essentially where Syria runs into Turkey. And you're looking at a depiction of what survives of the fortifications of the capital city of the Armenians at Sis, a site that is still there today. Um, the Armenian portion has been destroyed, but the site is still a, a functioning city. And this world of these Armenians do the opposite from Amir Hassan, whom I forgot to talk about. He's wearing Mongol dress. They are powerful in the Mongol courts. He and his father are dressed as they would be dressed to be at the Mongol courts. So you see their alliance and the source that it is tied to. When you get to Sis, the dress becomes more oriented to the two great powers that the king, that the king of Cilicia is competing with, the crusader states that all have more, um, Armenian wives, and the Byzantine Empire itself. Uh, the first king of Cilicia, uh, right at 1200, is given a crown by both the crusader, by the, uh, Rome, and by the Byzantine king. And the kingdom of Cilicia begins as a, a sub-state of the Byzantine Empire and in the 13th century, emerges for a certain number of decades as a very powerful source. And we were able to borrow from the Brotherhood of St. James in Jerusalem, which is an Armenian compound established by the 12th century for sure. This manuscript by one of the greatest of the Armenian artists, Toros Ruslin, and this is Prince Levon, and this is his wife, Lady Keron. They're both members of the ruling dynasty, the Hatumids, who by his lifetime are allies both with Louis IX king of France and, and the building of the Saint-Chapelle, and with the Mongol courts. The Armenians of Cilicia send Prince Levon's uncle to um, the Mongol court, and he returns with a peace treaty and with a Mongol wife. Uh, Mongols do not do treaties with sign texts. They do them with marriage exchanges. So we have records of Constable Simbat's uh, 
half Mongol child at the court years after this picture would have been made. It is a fascinating thing for those of us who are Byzantinists because the Christ blessing, this elaborate patterning, the two angels, the columns, the way the figures stand are all what we think of when you're thinking of Byzantine imperial imagery. And Levana has even got the tablion on his cloak, so he is certainly presenting himself as the equivalent to the Byzantine court. This is done right about the moment that the Latin kingdom of Constantinople falls. So at this time, there really is no strong Byzantine um, center for him to be in competition to. And yet, the Armenians are, oops, I'm going to be doing that all night, are quite happy to run this whole little series of plants and birds up the side, which ruins the symmetry. And the, Armenia, the, the Byzantines would have been so focused on the perfect symmetry of it. And the Armenians are fully aware of that, and they do it, but they don't care to maintain what we think would be that important symmetry. And I was interested that the men installing the um, galleries kept talking about the liveliness of the Armenian art. Prince Levon's uncle, another one, he has a lot of uncles, they're all powerful, Archbishop John, is this man at two ages of his life. And in the first one, he is wearing clerical robes that include the fleur-de-lis of France. And whether they come from as far west as France itself or from one of the cadet branches of the French royal family closer to Cilicia is not totally important for this question. Certainly the last Armenian king is buried in Saint-Denis in Paris with the French kings because he has so much French blood in him from the Lusignans. What this manuscript has, along with Prince uh, Archbishop Johannes introducing this family who here are posed in a much more crusader pose, a crusader prayer pose. The Virgin is spreading her mantle over them. The Christ child you could associate easily with Italian painting of the 13th century. In a few years, the Met's doing um, a show on Sienese painting, and we will once again return to the question of how do these work with Duccio's uh, famous Madonna of the Franciscans, because this work and others that relate to this pattern are very specifically dated into the 1270s, and we date Duccio's Madonna much later, so how do they connect? Probably through Franciscans with manuscripts, I would guess, because by this date, the Franciscans are very, very active in the uh, Cilician capital by 1289. They have their own monastery there, and one of the last Armenian kings badly wishes to uh, cease to be a king and to become a Franciscan monk. Um, but here, he's still elaborately dressed, but the lowest level of his garment has a Chinese dragon. And we have in the galleries a, a fleur-de-lis silk and the Chinese dragon this has been compared to. I will tell you that I think this is the two ends of their trade routes, that the Armenians gather um, people coming from Western Europe, further west in Europe, into their port cities like Ayas, who are very important on um, maps for trade routes, and then move them across the Mongol-controlled lands of the Okanid Mongols of Greater Syria, the Yuan Dynasty in China, the Golden Horde of the North, and that thus it makes perfectly good sense that Marco Polo would arrive in Ayas and end in China because we have records of Armenians helping uh, people get all the way to the Armenian uh, to the Mongol capital. We have records of the, Mong of the Armenians being able to protect people who are in the Arme uh, Mongol capital and are threatened. What will happen? Yes to the Armenians of Cilicia is that as the Mongols are attacked by the Mamluks from Egypt, a body no one ever expected to be so successful, the Mongols eat up the Crusader states and they move north and north. The last Christian port um, that is available is the, Mongol, the ports that go with the kingdom of Cilicia. And as that happens, Cilicians both stay in Cilicia but they also spread out. Some stay within the Byzantine Empire because this is one of my favorite books. This is an Armenian 
in Byzantine military wear. He is a Byzantine general. It's the only image of a Byzantine general in Byzantine military dress. His name is Armenian. The duke he serves is Armenian, and they serve a Byzantine emperor who is partially of Armenian descent. Uh, the manuscript is written in Armenian. He has to have been Orthodox to have the rank he had. It's, he, he comes from Thrace, this land um, east of, uh, west of uh, Constantinople. The manuscripts with the textiles I was talking about are here. The dragon is there. Taurus Ruslin is here. And we have this wonderful arm reliquary. And again, you have a motif that the Armenians get from elsewhere and transfer into something that is pro profoundly significant to them. Arm reliquaries are a Western type of relic container. This one is Saint Nicholas. Um, so the Orthodox Saint Nicholas, the um, medallion on his hand looks very Byzantine. He is a patron of travelers. He's Santa Claus to modern man, but he was a patron of travelers, so he would make sense on of people that dominate trade routes. The, the close ties with Rome may be important because in the 13th century there are popes named Nicholas. What will happen to it in Armenia is it stays in Cilicia, this place, on the Mediterranean, but its influence spreads across Armenia. And part of it is as the Mamluks destroy the Armenian lands. Some stay there, and as with all the other manuscripts, we say into the 14th century, they're still quite affluent because there's still a, a lot of gold ground manuscripts. This one is by Sargis Pidsak, Sargis C B B B B E E. Oh. And he is quite confident of himself that in a gospel book he paints himself. And if you look at it closely, he is painting the head of the Armenian church, the Catholicos, who resides at Sis. And at the top, you have Matthew introducing the gospels uh, and the gospel of Matthew itself. So while Sargis is the smallest figure, he has carefully posed himself very much like Matthew. Um, and a, a willingness to present themselves that we don't think of when we think of the Middle Ages. We don't think in general of um, Byzantines or Byzantine related being so um, dominant in showing their artists and their artists showing themselves as positions of power. And then the Armenians from Crimea, from Cilicia move. And many of them move to Italy presumably ones <clears throat> most allied with the Roman church. And so you get this beautiful manuscript made in Bologna, which will be of site important to us as we go on in this lecture. Others move to the Crimea, like the Gregory Trotiv manuscript I show you, which I think they move to because it is still controlled by the Mongols, so they can pick up their trade routes and move them easily. And others go back to the Armenian homeland, back to the base of Mount Ararat, and in the exhibition, we show you the church at Lake Savan and works that actually come from that church that had been moved to the History Museum. And in this gallery, we're able to show you um, the School of Gladzor, which is called a second Athens because of the academic learning of its time, and a certain number of important liturgical works that are relics that are still venerated today, but were particularly important uh, when they were made and one is this banner, which shows you Gregory the Illuminator, Ripsame, and Tridot, and it's made in the 1440s, and it becomes a symbol of the person who is the official Catholicos, because there's a, a great deal of chaos as the Catholicos in Cilicia remains there, but they elect a new Catholicos in Greater Armenia, and they are competing, and you get another, um, round of elaborate um, additions to relics. And one of the relics that the Armenians um, hold most dear is the lance, which according to Armenian tradition, one there are like four of these lances, um, was the lance that the centurion used to pierce Christ's side, and that after Christ's death, the centurion goes north, um, converting people to Christianity, and that when he dies, he leaves the lance in Armenia. And as with many of these traditions, we do not have records on the lance, 
for many years, and the lance we were allowed to borrow is the copy from 1700 of the original. The original did not leave Armenia. But what is interesting for the exhibitions part is that that lance is given to a very ancient monastery in um, the 1300s by the Prussian family. And the original container, which only survives in a few inscriptions on the back, talk about the Proch dedication of it. And when they give it to this ancient monastery, the monastery's name soon becomes the, the Monastery of the Lance, which is Gegard. If you go to Armenia today, it's one of the most beautiful and best preserved and still most active pilgrimage spots in Armenia. It remains alive and continuing to carry connections back to the very beginning, because the Armenians, while they convert as a nation in the fourth century, um, trace themselves to the apostolic tradition of St. Thaddeus and Bartholomew and the first generation of Christian missionaries. If you go to the show, you will also hear liturgical music here so that you get a sense of the Armenian, um, the beauty of the Armenian language, which I cannot produce for you. Um, the next gallery that takes you to Scriptoria, and I find it quite stunning that I'm talking about a period when we are normally accurately describing Greater Armenia and the lands around it as being attacked by all sorts of major destructive forces, Timurlane, uh, for Seljuks, Mongols, Timurlane. It's, these are cultures that destroy heavily, um, and yet the Mongols ultimately use the Armenians to run their trade routes, both in Cilicia and in Greater Armenia. And suddenly I have for you several Alexander romances. And that's the most I can give you of the secular world of the Armenians. So what we've done in this gallery is we have from the Getty, the monk, the celibate monk in his robes, handing to his pupil the ink pot. So this is the passing on of a generation of scholarship and manuscript production. And these two men who look like they should be chugging beer are actually polishing paper with very heavy stones. And the inscription says from the senior monk that they are, they are like saints for him because they polish all of his paper. And we think that's why they have halos. The Armenians use paper long before anybody else does. They are getting it from the trade routes from the east. And if any of you have ever paid for printing paper, um, the high, more highly polished the paper is, the better it holds the type, and the more expensive they charge for it today, uh, much less in um, the Middle Ages. And then we have, from Venice, the Mechadist Fathers, a little book that I've turned on edge to show you this composite animal and this is the manuscript in Jerusalem where that animal is copied almost exactly. And we have another Alexander romance in which the animal is copied less exactly. And for those of you who do not know what I am talking about, the Alexander romance is the story of Alexander the Great. So around 1300, we're talking about someone who's been dead since before the birth of Christ. And he is a... Uh, accumulated many mystic legends about the, the miracles and the, the travels he has. And our favorite for the show is this manuscript from the Matanadron in Etchmia's Inn, where Alexander with his crown is being swallowed by the giant crab. <laughs> and many of our editors wanted that to be the cover for the catalog, because it is just, <laughs> it's funny, you're laughing, it is funny. We don't think of East Christian art as having humor. And they do in these works. And then he gets out, saves himself, dry, gets the dry land, and the birds arrive and tell him not to go any further because he's going into a land of darkness and he'll never come out of it. And Alexander, with the same crown, tells his men to leave the baby donkeys at their base camp and to go into the land of dark, darkness with the mothers because then when the babies are really hungry, they'll start screaming and the mothers will make their way back to the base camp and they will be able to enter the land of darkness and come out of it alive again. 
and as you, it's heavily illuminated. The man who is writing it is a priest in Rome, Italy. He has gone on a mission to Italy, and when he is write, writing this, one of the men working on it with him is another Armenian artist, this gentleman, who is Hakab of Yulfa. And as you can see, his wardrobe is very different from Sargis Pitsak's, but he is equally willing for you to know what he looks like. <laughs> and, and in this manuscript, this is, when you see it up close, this is a beautiful, beautiful image of the cross coming at the second coming, and the wings of the angels are the, the lines that you see extending beyond the edge of the frame. And it's very elegant. Hakab is also credited with this manuscript, which people suggest he was taking drugs as he drew it, because it, as you look at it, it is so weird. Um, this is God, and this is God on the seventh day of creation. I think he looks like a one to two year old child when you have those huge heads on little babies and the tiny bodies, and God is looking at the animal, the creatures of Ezekiel's vision. And, he, and the heavens are behind him. And then on the last page, shrunken tremendously, he is welcoming you through the gates of heaven. And you have had the other days of creation earlier in the manuscript. And it too goes on to have a number of amazingly complex and exotic images. And Hakab himself is, in a way, ev evidence for what happens to Armenians. He is from a town called Yulfa. Uh, we have a Hachkar from there in the exhibition. It is a town that in part of his life is part of the Ottoman Empire, and thus he is an artist of the Ottoman Empire. But in the last galleries, we will leave the Ottoman Empire and enter the Persian Empire. And the movement of a large number of Armenians from Yulfa to the capital of the Persian Empire, where they establish a residential section, New Jalfa, includes a large number of artists moving, and Hakab paints in both Old and New Jalfa. And thus he is one of the artists that brings the traditions of the Lake Van region of Armenia into Persian lands. What is the most unusual object, and for us the most uh, exciting discovery, is the University of Bologna. We are back to Bologna. Uh, in 1691, a nobleman from Bologna goes to Constantinople, now also Istanbul, capital of the Ottoman Empire, with the delegation from the Venetian uh, am ambassador to the Ottoman court. And this nobleman orders from an outstanding Armenian, a major Armenian intellect, int intellect of his time in Istanbul, a map showing all the Armenian churches in the Ottoman Empire. It's 10 feet long. It is four feet wide. It swallows the room. You stand at this end, and you're in Constantinople. And you look out across the Ottoman Empire, and down here, you have Mount Ararat. So you've gotten to essentially the eastern edge of the empire. And here, you have the, the Catholicos of the Armenians and Etchmizin, the Vatican of the Armenians. These golden circles are Jerusalem. If you come to the Menton Sea, this is Gregory the Illuminator, looking like he came from Brigadoon and he is destroying the golden idols of mush. But what's quite fascinating to me is these drawings are very accurate. So you have Etchmizin, you have Ripsamay's church, um, and then you have in the text here, so I blew it up for you here, so here's St. Ripsamay's Martyrium, here's Etchmizin, and here's a group of gentlemen whom we are certain these are Armenian clergy, we're less certain whether the elaborately just man is an Ottoman Pasha or a wealthy Armenian. 
um, who would dress very much the same. They are discussing the founding of the Armenian church. And so on the audio guide that we have, you can listen to it being read in Armenian as they tell you the story, including how the historian Agatangelos tells you that King Tradot, with his rat head, kneeling here, is with Gregory the Illuminator, standing in full regalia um, next to an archangel who is showing you the vision in which Christ accompanied with the dove of the Holy Spirit and God descends to earth and with his golden hammer marks the site of the first Armenian Christian church. And for all of us who are here for a conference, you know that there are many people who disagree about where Gregory the Illuminator would have landed if he ever landed. But the Armenian tradition is that Etchmizin was and is that spot. And this is an altar frontal sent from New Jolfa in the 1600s to Etchmizin because it is the spot where Christ descended and chose the site for the first Christian church. And whether it's true or not, we accept um, the possibility that St. Peter is buried under the Vatican, that the Holy Sepulchre is on a site associated with the actual event of Christ's death. This is another Christian culture looking at a specific detail of their own definition and believing it with the sincerity that we give to these other sites. And I think it could be argued we should really respect it. This is Etchmiazen today, where Pope Francis visited recently. And then the other aspect that you should note is that these flowers are Persian, but the details are Western manuscripts. And the narrative goes back to the very beginning of Armenian Christianity, that Armenians are going to weave these threads together in ways that are often disconcerting to us, but completely reasonable to them. And we include a number of sites that are in the Ottoman Empire by this period that have been important to Armenian from Armenians for many centuries. And our favorite is this 12 foot by 12 foot curtain. Armenian churches do not have iconostasis. Armenians do not venerate icons. The word, the gospel is the object they venerate. And they close a curtain across the front of the altar rather than shutting it off in some other way. So this is something that like a stage curtain would be pulled across. And what you're looking at is places that are important to Armenians in Jerusalem. Not just places sacred to Christians, but places sacred to Armenian Christians. So here you have the Armenian quarter in the old city where they are established by the 12th century. And they have the head of St. James, which is depicted here. And over here you have the Holy Sepulchre and the Stone of Unction. And in here you have the names of the donors. Um, because this yellow line tells you what everything is. And then we're still trying to decide, is this pilgrims who have come? Are the three priests with the chalices making a Trinitarian statement? Exactly what this is. It was printed in what is now Tokat. The technique that it was printed in is brought from India. And by this date, Armenians control all the internal and external trade and textiles in India. It won't last forever, but for now they do. And they are still in cis. They are no longer a kingdom, but they are wealthy there. And you have this cover where you see what happens to the arm reliquary that begins with St. Nicholas. This is the recently rediscovered arm reliquary of Shahak Patev, who is the Catholic host in the fourth century who urges the writing, the Mesrop Mashtaj to create the, the alphabet. And when this work was in the exhibition that some of you will have known that were in, was in Paris in 2007, it was associated with another saint. And what has happened is they found a large glass negative that along the side identifies it as Shahak Patev in Russian, French, and Armenian. You can tell what countries it's dealing with at the end of the 19th century. So 
but each of the prelates holds an arm reliquary and they hold it because of this large cauldron. In the Armenian church, the uh, oil for unction is made every seven years of uh, 40 herbs and spices and in part of the very elaborate ceremony, the arm of St. Gregory is used to stir the oil, which then allows you, of course, to see the sacred oil as going back to the founder of the Armenian church as a nation. And it, the arm is a symbol of, he who has the arm is he who is the Catholicos. You also have a very lovely gold pyx from the Gulbenkian Museum in um, Portugal, which is very appropriate because the pyx is one of the works we have in the exhibition that come from Kaiseri, ancient Caesarea, which is where Gregory the Illuminator came from. So again, you have a, a wealthy and important Armenian community. And for people interested in antiquities, our um, Islamic art, two other people that come from Caesarea who are Kaiseri, who are Armenians, are Kalekian and Kavorkian, who are two of the major dealers in the late 19th, 20th century, who bring immense amount of art into museums in Europe and America. And Kavorkian Fund was incredibly generous funding the show, so we're very fond of them. And what will happen is that these Armenians in the Ottoman Empire, and particularly in Julfa, which is just where everybody beats everybody up, um, are Ottomans in the previous slide. And then Shah Abbas arrives to con take control of Iran, and he builds a new empire, the Safavid Empire. And what he does in 1604 is to go to Armenia, um, go into Armenian lands, which to him are simply Ottoman lands, and to take the people of Julfa to his capital. The people of Julfa are incredibly important in control of the silk trade. Shah Abbas wants to use the silk trade to build his wealth. Silk is to his time frame as oil is to us, as cotton was in the era of the Civil War. And so he negotiates um, that all the Armenians living in Julfa will come to his capital they will, if they're rich, they will ride in a carriage. If they are not, they will walk. And if they walk, many of them will die. So it's a, a very horrible forced migration, somewhat like in this country, the, the Trail of Tears. And when they get to um, Isfahan and ultimately establish their site of New Julfa, they, within a very few years, are placed by the Shah in charge of all external trade for the Persian Empire. So that when Sheila Canby, uh, now the head of the Islamic Department at the Met, but previously in the British Museum, when she did a wonderful show on Shah Abbas, the first gallery was Armenians. Because no ideas came into Persia that weren't allowed in through this Armenian trade. And the Armenians then, in charge of this trade, spread out north into Russia where they give a diamond thread, um, encrusted throne to um, the Tsar all over India where they are invited to control the trade routes um, out to Manila by 1614. And Martin the Armenian is at Jamestown in 1618, probably trying to figure out if Jamestown would be a good place to grow silk. I, seriously, I mean, it's a commercial venture. Um, one portion of these Armenians Again, they hold to the traditions of the past. So you have John the Evangelist um, being dictated to for the book of God, the Gospel of John and pointing to Prochorus to write it down. And by this time, the, the, the Byzantine little black um, semicircle that is the cave from which he emerges has become this pulsating light of inspiration. But it's also the cave. And in another manuscript, you have incredibly ornate and beautiful canon tables that in the show you'll see the 14th century canon tables that they're an exact copy of. Things come to Isfahan, Isfahan honors them, and at the same time you have wealthy Armenian prelates, and you can tell from the inside of this church that they're also looking at modern contemporary Western art and are copying it all over its walls. 
so much so that it is possible that this scene here is the same scene in a church in Colombia in Latin America. A, a scholar that I was with at the Getty with says that the church she studies there is copied in Goa and in, the, in this one church in Isfahan. And the Armenians are in Colombia collecting gold and silver for the Shah. And the Middle Ages for the Armenians and my talk end when the Armenians are able to have extensive numbers of printed books in Armenian. And their first printed book is much earlier. It's in the upper left corner, and it's from 1512. And it's essentially a book for merchant travelers. It gives you some prayers that you can have kind of a little service for yourself and remedies for various maladies. But in 1666, the Armenian merchants of New Jalfa fund in Amsterdam the Ashkan Bible, which brings more of these Western images into the East because they buy the wood blocks of Christoffel von Sikkim, a man who had no interest in copyright law and made wood blocks on any style he liked. He added Albrecht Dura's um, initials whenever it pleased him. But the wood blocks actually reach as far as Constantinople. And then in 1695, these Dutch um, merchants make this huge map which looks like a map appropriate for any rich person in the world, and they were made for every rich person in the world in different languages. But what's distinctive about this one is it's totally in Armenian. So it is, the Armenians are rich enough, affluent enough, transporting goods of sufficient wealth that there is a market to sell them these huge maps, and the, you can't see it on this, but right down there, there's a little phrase in Persian saying a view of the world. So we think they're for the Khojas of Isfahan rather than for the wealthy Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. And then finally printed books reach Etchmiazin itself, and we were encouraged to borrow um, a book from Etchmiazin's printing house so that we would um, be able to borrow the other things we wanted from Etchmiazin, but also because then printing is actually being done in the heart of Armenia. And interestingly, the book we were lent is Josephus's War Against the Romans. And it is a book that is thought to have been uh, printed to encourage Armenians to stand up to the Ottomans and the Persians under whom they were um, occupied as Josephus's people had stood up to the Romans. So that it was a type of political propaganda but it also goes with the fact that the Armenians know Plato and Aristotle and have connections to classical learning throughout the uh, time frame of this talk. In the end, the Armenians are part of the world we live in. Uh, through these centuries, when I began studying Armenian art, they were still being taught as the people who were isolated and no one ever really knew them and thus they represented a lost purity of the early Christian world. What we hope this show has shown is that they are in fact actively engaged in the world in many ways in the broadest possible sense. They are always anchored back into their homeland. You can see the type of valleys that trade goods must have gone through. This is Noravank, the burial site of another of the um, Mongol, a wealthy Armenian, uh, or Belians in this case. Uh, I think Armenians today, wherever they are, remember where they came from and are actively engaged in the worlds they're in. And that it would be interesting for us to think of art more as something that touches you to your past and something that is contemporary to your world, rather than thinking, why isn't this one or the other? I think the Armenians are very much a voice of multiplicity. Thank you for listening to me. Sure. I've been asked if I would take questions. I think you actually ought to go see this museum, but if you wish to ask <laughs> me questions, you're not going to get back to this museum. You can come to New York and see the exhibition and, and, and track me down, but I'm happy to answer any questions you'd like.
I go look at the McVeigh. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I think a lot of us during your lecture were wondering how we can get to New York this fall and how we can book a ticket to see your beautiful exhibition. Yeah. Thank you, please. Annie, thank you for bringing everyone here. Enjoy the McNay. Every room is open to you tonight. Every gallery, enjoy the medieval collection. Enjoy the Gauguins, the Van Goghs, the Picassos we're known for. And venture into Latin America, discover what pop can do to change and enrich lives. Thank you very much. Have a great conference. <laughs>